Jeff Atwater, Florida's chief financial officer, has made fiscal transparency and government accountability key components of his political philosophy. Today, he'll share his views on these issues, the just completed legislative session, and what lies ahead for the state. Next, on Metro Center Outlook. Hello, I'm Diane Trees. Jeff Atwater grew up in North Palm Beach and built a successful 20-year career in banking. In 2000, he was elected to the Florida House of Representatives. He went on to serve in the state Senate, and in 2010, he was elected Florida's chief financial officer. CFO Atwater, welcome to the show. Diane, thanks for having me back. Good to be with you. Thank you. You are in your second term as right. CFO. How does the office serve the citizens of Florida? Well, thank you. It serves in several ways, and, and I love the comments that you already touched upon, that the transparency and accountability, you know, it's, it's now an $80 billion budget, and we perform better, those of us in government, when we know that the citizens can see and watch and critique our behavior, what we do, decisions we make. So one way was to create a far greater level of transparency so that the citizens of the state could see how we're spending their money. So that was one of the issues we worked on. We've worked on very hard and we've really had some great successes. Another area is that just imagine how much of the household wallet, that, that, that personal income that goes for some mandatory spending such as mortgage payments or insurance payments. And there's a tremendous, regrettably, there's a tremendous amount of fraud that has existed here in Florida. And so auto insurance, homeowners insurance, windstorm insurance. In recent years, these have been, these have been escalating at a pace that was, that was actually moving faster than household income. So our office engaging in, in fighting that insurance fraud that existed so that we could give the occasion for the, for the consumer to get the best possible rate uh, on their insurance and not be paying for fraud that's been built, built into the system and, and, and needlessly. So there are many ways in which we can help keep costs down, make costs and, and expenditures transparent, and really get the value of citizen feedback. You served in the House of Representatives, and then you moved to the State Senate. Right. You ultimately were Senate President. How does that wealth of experience help you with fulfilling the duties for CFO? You know, Diane, it was important. The those steps um, helped me understand the process of what goes on in Tallahassee, the pace, the flow of information, the participants, the advocacy that comes. So all that was valuable. But I would tell you, there was something far greater than those experiences that have helped, and that was being in the private sector, being a banker, calling on small business owners, really understanding the challenges that that one takes to get up, unlock the doors before dawn, persevere, run a business, hire, make their way through reg regulatory schemes, and, and, and still be able to compete in a marketplace. It was that experience that has been tremendously helpful now, is serving as our CFO to have, well, that should be the same expectations, that, that we should lower regulatory burdens. I now know how hard it is for small business owners to make it that we would create greater levels of transparency so more people could see and understand the decision-making process. So really, far more than just being a part of the political or the government process of being in the legislature, which was valuable, was really working with the private sector citizens almost my entire career in understanding that, that they're really facing their own challenges and we should not be an additional burden. We should have certain safeguards, regula regulations for consumer safety, but boy, don't overburden that and keep costs down, keep taxes down, let people grow and build and create. They're gonna be the drivers of this economy. So really it was that, that experience that, that has informed most of my decision making. Now the 2016 legislative session just ended. Yes. What were priorities for you and, and how did they fare? I'll tell you what, it was a wonderful legislative session. I hope all of your viewers would see this legislature came in, it balanced the budget, it reduced taxes, it reduced regulation. Um, it, it kept the focus on outward looking, not inward looking. It was a wonderful legislative session for the people of Florida. For us, there were really two significant consumer initiatives. One was what was called balanced billing or surprise billing, and that is you enter into an insurance relationship with a health care provider, and yet you find yourself in an emergency room car accident, whatever, whatever the incident might have been, and then you find out only later you get this bill, the hospital was part of your, your, your health care network, but the emergency room physician wasn't, the radiologist wasn't, right. and next you get this bill, and it was being left on the consumers, and they were being hounded, and we finally said enough. 
So, so that will be no more, that it will now be the responsibilities of those parties to negotiate an outcome. But if the consumer believed they had protection, they're going to get that protection of that coverage. That was really important. The second one was what we thought was really tremendously important as well. Historically, life insurance companies, and for the most part, many do the right thing. I do not want to uh, disparage the industry. But they sell different financial services products. One would be an annuity. You give the insurance company a set principal amount of money, and over the rest of your life, on a periodic basis, they will pay that back to you, that annuity payment that you can live off of. Then they will also sell you a product where you send them a premium, and they'll commit to pay you a principal sum to your, to your, to your family, the beneficiary, when you pass away. Well, we found out years ago by doing audits on some of these insurance companies that they were using data that would inform them the moment that one of their annuitants had passed away, and they immediately shut off the annuity payment to the family. But they never handed that information across the hallway to the person to pay the life insurance benefit. And even though they would have known that that family member had passed away, they would not pay the life insurance benefit until maybe that family found out that there had been a policy right. that existed. Which not everybody would be aware of or no, understand. No, of course not, because it could have been before the children were born, a spouse did it, uh, you did it for the children to go to college someday. And when we did our investigation, we had found that $500 million, a half a billion dollars, was sitting in life insurance companies for people that they knew had actually passed away. We took it nationwide, brought in our counterparts, the treasurers of the other states, $8 billion of unpaid life insurance benefits for individuals they knew had passed away. So the law was, going forward, you will now use this electronic data, it's from the Social Security Administration, and run that annually to see if, in fact, you get a match, and then reach out to that family and make good on the promise that you made. In, in Florida, so again, in Florida, just, just the companies that came in and settled with us that understood that their behavior was wrong, 20 companies out of over 300 life insurance companies that do business in Florida, we've already been able to return about $500 million in life insurance benefits that should have gone to those families. So we're now asking all the other companies to comply with the same settlement agreement. Just check once a year that you, and find out if you have somebody who you've been serving and make that benefit payment to that family. The governor just signed the bill. We're very excited. It's really a model now for the nation. So That's a huge I'm very amount excited. of money. It's a tremendous amount of money, right. and that money was sitting in the treasury of those insurance companies year in and year out, and they were making the investment returns. They were benefiting from that money sitting in their treasury, and they knew it belonged in someone else's hands. Congratulations on it's that. It's an exciting right. win. For the consumers of Florida, yes. it's a really exciting win. Yes. Another area is, is fraud. Yes. Now, you said that fraud is the silent killer of the right. economy. What did you mean by that, and what areas are you looking at with, sure. with Florida and fraud? Sure, and, 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 and the silence is, is that it, you get the, the, the consumers, again, watching us today, they get, the, they get the auto insurance bill, and they look at that, and they're wondering, how can I make all of this work? Um, uh, they get the homeowner's insurance bill, and they go, my goodness, it's up again, but we had no claim. What has been happening in Florida is that there have been staged car accidents where, where people are actually staging a car accident in a parking lot. They go get the full payout of all the benefits. They'll, they'll find seven or eight people to get in the car, bump into each other. There's really no accident and there's no injury. But they will milk the benefits and who's going to get stuck? All the other honest people in the community when it comes in from that geographic area, more losses, more losses, and more losses. So, the, so the, really the silent killer to economic growth is that family has to absorb that ever-increasing cost of insurance. So we've committed ourselves by our investigations, undercover investigations, in both homeowners insurance fraud, um, water damages that never really occurred, but they flooded the house themselves, got a whole new kitchen, got all new tile. Uh, the honest person living next door, their rates go up because, again, in the geography, more losses have occurred. We have arrested in the last couple of years now over 7,000 people for insurance fraud with a 91% 91, 91 conviction ratio. I have no sympathy. I have absolutely no hesitation to put these people behind bars. They are driving up the cost. They are hurting the ability of their neighbors to try to make ends meet. And, and if it gets the prices get so high, uh, the, the single parent can't afford the car at all. And that's what we were going to fight against. We're going to let the best possibility for you to be able to afford what you need in this state and not let, um, not let the bad actors drive you out of home ownership or auto ownership. Thank you. Yes, you bet. <laughs> now, you're in your second term. Right. That will finish in 2018. What other areas of improvement, some issues, what do you want to tackle 
with the remaining time that you have. Yes, thank you. You've already you. done quite a bit. <laughs> well, there's so much more to be done. But but we want to continue to work on, again, creating greater, even greater levels of transparency to more people can see how their government spends their money, more Floridians critiquing our behavior. We also want to work towards greater levels of financial literacy. And, and that is, um, we've, we've been working so hard on modules that can be provided to our school system, that can be provided and delivered to our seniors community on identity protection, uh, on identity theft. Uh, protecting against identity theft of our we are we're such an incredible state for our for our, our national defense so many of our veterans and active military are stationed in Florida how to protect them and be sure they're wise as to what may happen in their financial world and be able to plan financially for their future so education system uh, our, our senior community and our veterans and our military helping them on on their financial literacy as well and then a, the never-ending challenge of being sure that we have an incredible fiscal discipline in our state so we don't fall into what regrettably other states have fallen into, spending money they don't have, borrowing money they should not be borrowing, uh, which then leads to increased taxes and the inability for one to help make ends meet or build their small business, or overburdening regulations that again prevent uh, economic activity and someone smarting, starting a small business. So fiscal discipline, I would still say remains job one for us in Florida. I'm really proud of where we're at, um, the financial literacy, and really continuing to become more and more transparent. We'll talk a little bit more about both of those okay, issues good. in just a moment. Good, thank you. When we return, we'll continue our discussion with CFO Jeff Atwater. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Our guest today is Florida's Chief Financial Officer, Jeff Atwater. CFO Atwater, historically, Florida has been pretty dependent on tourism, agriculture, construction for economics. How are we doing to diversify the economy so we don't hit rock bottom when the next right. cycle comes through of a recession? Diane, you're so right on that. And there will be another economic cycle. There will be a weakness in, in some time in the near future. And that's the point is, what can we learn now and what can we be doing now over the next few years? That means that dip is more shallow than it was the last time around. And I'll tell you what, Central Florida has been the driver for this. You, you've mentioned we've been strong in, in tourism, strong in, uh, in second home buying, uh, and uh, in strong in agriculture. Those have been really great three, three legs of this pillar. Uh, but we must diversify now is a good time for that. And, and again, Central Florida has been a driver. So you can think of, first imagine our, our defense. Um, this is again, is an incredible community with, with, with such commitment, such talent in technology that being coming involved in the, uh, the military contracting, which could be anything from uh, sensors to the, uh, the simulations that are taking place, that's significant. That's high tech, that's real intellectual talent coming here. The, 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 probably the biggest one to speak about is in life sciences. Again, in Central Florida, this, this incredible hub that has been created at Medical City is bringing together the, the Sanford Burnham Research. It's bringing together medical school students in the future of, of medicine. It's bringing together uh, children's hospitals, uh, the, VA, the VA, and, and it's doing an incredible amount to attract the branding of the state of Florida that there is, if you're going to do life science research, boy, Central Florida is an incredible place to be exploring this. Manufacturing more globally, again, in technology and uh, in more significant manufacturing, what we've done recently is we've eliminated the sales tax on manufacturing equipment, and we're trying to begin to lower the cost of of leasing property in Florida. There's been historically a sales tax on leases in Florida. And that's going to show, I think, some really good dividends because we do compete. Uh, and so there are states that if you're trying to attract someone in the large industrial manufacturing work that is going to have significant machinery or these robots that are going to be doing, again, military defense work or life science work, these are millions of dollars worth of investments in sales tax year after year on this kind of equipment is significant. So we're trying to show um, the rest of the country and, frankly, the world this would be the place to bring the intellectual capital, to bring manufacturing, and I, and I think we're off to a really good start. And certainly, again, Central Florida is leading the way. You know, we do have some different 
demographics and population. We have a transient population to a certain extent, a lot of people in and out. We have a retired population. Does that pose any disadvantages for trying to be more innovative with the state? No, it's a really good question. And, and that's when, I, again, I think of Florida as being a bellwether. The diversity of Florida, both across age, across all the demographics, is, is really going to be something the whole country will be experiencing. So again, a chance for us to set the model and, and, to, and to take advantage of this. So I would actually tell you that, that imagine Florida becoming and already being recognized as one of the most innovative states where entrepreneurial opportunity is created. Again, I think our regulatory and our tax environment is, is attracting entrepreneurs that you have this wealth of talent that, that may be in retirement years, but they have an opportunity now to become the mentors, become the board members of these, of these smaller entrepreneurial initiatives. And, and boy, are they putting themselves to work. So here, right here at UCF, in our innovation centers, these partnerships are being built at all of our universities across the state. These partnerships that we're bringing in incredible talent that may have thought they came to Florida to retire are really eager to get back involved and lend their expertise and in, in their uh, in their historical um, talent and experience to a new endeavor. And I take that as been an incredible value for us. So that there really is, I think, it, there is a tremendous amount of that, that transient nature to this, but in the, for the most part, it's a winner. And I just read an article saying the same thing, that yeah. the, the retired population is actually has a high percentage of entrepreneurial skills and wanting to, to start up companies, which I thought was amazing. It is amazing, and they're doing it, and they're partnering with us, again, right here on university campuses. You, you, as the chief financial officer, how would you describe the fiscal state right now for Florida? It is very good, but, but you just can never take anything for granted. I would tell you this, and I want your viewers to know. I, so as CFO, I am really at the state treasurer along with a number of other hats that I have the privilege of wearing. I would not trade places with any other state treasurer, and they all know that. They, they all watched with, with really, I think, very impressed on how during that recession, we lowered taxes, we lowered our debt, we increased our reserves. Um, the rating agencies looked upon us with a AAA credit rating as the gold standard. How could they make the decisions that fast, that dramatic, to turn that state around? And all of it was to keep hands in the, in, uh, dollars in the hands of the consumer or dollars in the hands of the small business owner. They would bring us back. So I would tell you now, we have, we're have going to have revenue next year, probably over a billion, billion and a half more than this year. That means the economic activity is creating the conditions where revenue is coming to the state of Florida. We're not going to keep that. We're going to cut taxes again and give most of that money back. We have uh, the, one of the lowest debt ratios now, certainly lowest among our peer group, the largest states. That means that interest payments aren't going to have to be made on those dollars in the future, but we can put any incoming dollar really back to work on education or back to work on in infrastructure. So when, when, when outside, there is a, um, the Mercatus Institute at George Mason University that stacks up all 50 states and looks at their financial condition. They rank Florida number five in the country. Our peers, New York is number is 50, California 48, uh, Illinois 46. Our peer states are in really big trouble, but they look at Florida fifth, and we're, we're behind, I think, Alaska, Wyoming, South Dakota, and North Dakota. Now, those are all fine states, but the, the, the complexity uh, of, of a 20 million population um, and where we are in this peninsula and the risk of that and the challenge of attracting manufacturing, I think, I think people would look at this and say, wow, what a, what a success story. So I could tell you, uh, for, for anyone watching and listening to us today, they should feel very comfortable that their state is in a condition where we have the capacity to grow. We are now agile, we are flexible, we'll be able to take advantage of opportunities, we will not be burdening any new player coming to Florida with, with a tax, unexpected tax. So I think as the, as, the, as the world is looking for a place to build the next plant, to expand the business endeavor, they'll be looking at Florida as great workforce, um, as a really fiscally sound and, and innovative and, and not gonna be a regulatory burden. So I think we're in really good shape. You mentioned before um, one of the other cornerstones for you as, as CFO has been financial literacy. Right. You have a website, yes. Your, Money Matters. Your Money Matters. Can you talk a little bit about that, what it offers to citizens? Sure, and I would hope that anyone might choose to go. It's Your Money Matters. The, the website is myfloridacfo.com, Your Money Matters. It's, it's a collection of, of, of different um, a, a, points in time in life that might be relevant to, to where anyone might be, um, and, but they can, they can look to how it could help, again, in the educational world, 
um, in, uh, in the, where they may be as a, uh, again, a, a senior within our state of Florida. And so we, we really created these, these modules to be available and you can click right on it for both a written guidance that one can read and share with others to also now video walkthrough. Um, so if you were wanting to, to sit down with someone else that you thought might this might find this valuable, if as a teacher you wanted to deploy the module, um, we, we are often on the road in our senior communities around the state bringing in local talent, our local sheriffs, on, on matters of, again, things to be careful of, things to watch for, how to protect yourself. We'll bring in local state's attorneys on if you're suspicious of anything, who to reach out and contact. Um, and we'll bring in, again, our local educational uh, uh, talent to talk about what's available here hands-on that this community could offer. So it's it's really a nice wide range of modules that uh, that I think for for each each area that that might have a particular need they can find it. It's quite user friendly. Thank I, you. I've taken a Thank look you. at it a, a number of yeah. times. The last time you were here, you were just in the process of implementing a transparency right. issue again, um, a website that would help with transparency in state contracts. How right. is that? Progressed. It, you know, Diane, we're really excited about it. And here's when, when you're when we have the responsibility. The legislature sets the policy. I now must perform. I must be sure that everyone delivers upon what was expected. So I don't think most of your viewers would know that it's an eighty billion dollar state budget, but seventy percent of the budget is not being delivered through a state employee. It's being delivered through a contracted vendor. It could be a food service provider. It could be a health care provider. It could be a road builder. But historically, there was no way for the competitors in that field to know that there was a contract coming up unless they, they called and did a public records request, uh, nor would the press know who was constantly getting that contract. So we put in, and you were, you were, you were so kind to, to allow me to talk about that, we put in law that going forward, you must now put in every state contract a clear deliverable right from the start, performance measures, and, and financial consequences if the vendor doesn't deliver on the promise. They must be held accountable financially. Then we wanted to put them online so all vendors could see it, all the press could see it, and any citizens could see it. So now we have 78,000 state contracts online. 66% of them are now imaged, so you could actually read the contract in full. We're working on getting them all up. <laughs> it's a breakthrough. That's amazing. There is one particular organization known as PERG that ranks every state's transparency. Are you really wanting the citizens to see what you're doing? So when you and I talked last, we were a D, uh, and today we're an A for three years running, that they rank all states. No state made the move that we moved, and they've been very complimentary of now what's available to the public. So imagine now, if you're a vendor, you know all your competitors are going to get to read your contract. They're going to see whether or not you're performing. Imagine if you're now the agency, you're going to know that the public and the press are seeing who you're negotiating with. So you can't just give it to a lobbyist or to the vendor that did it last time. You have to make people sharpen their pencil, get in and sit down in front of you, and show you that they're going to deliver. And if they don't deliver, I'm watching to see, well, you better not have, you better not have sent me an invoice to pay the bill if they haven't delivered on the accountabilities. So it's really healthy because it's your money that we're spending. It's not mine. That's so we want people held accountable. A lot that you've done. Thank you so much for your work. Diane, thank you. Now, as CFO, you are in your final term. I It'll am. end in 2018. Right. What's next for you? You know, I don't know what's next. We, we, we've we approached this, this role just as we had approached the others as, can we dive in? Can we explore the opportunities for improvement? Can we become more efficient? Can we become more effective? Can we can we pick up the game and deliver more for the taxpayers of Florida? So so for two more years, I have the privilege of, of pressing on in that endeavor. And in the near term, we might begin to explore: is there is there another place for us in public service, or is the best role for us to uh, to return home to our community and and to. Uh, to begin to try to uh, throw ourselves in with all the enthusiasm we can to uh, helping build our community again as we once were there every day. So, so there's some possibilities out there. We'll see what comes. Thank you so much for your public service and for all the good things you've done while you've been CFO. And you still have time to go. <laughs> yes. Thanks, Diane. Thanks for letting me be with you. Thank you. That's our show for today. Join us next week when we again explore issues important to Central Florida. Thanks for watching. I'm Diane Trees.